I want us to take a look at standing waves. And you've now seen them in at least two times. Like this, standing wave. You have to be standing to do the standing wave. Oh, yo, stand real quick. Ready, ready, there you go. But if it's a true standing wave, it's not just a wave that goes once. It's going to hit a boundary and rebound backwards. All right, hold on, hold on, because we got to do the things. No, 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 we got to do the thing. You've now seen this on a string, like the one over there. You've seen it on a slinky. But the actual application of why standing waves are interesting is because they kind of put together all the things about waves in the same place. So to help us out, I'm going to draw us a picture. Let's say I have a wave on a ukulele string. Okay. And let's say that my wave, it travels down to the end of the ukulele and it hits a barrier. What does a wave do when it hits a barrier? It reflects backward. So if I draw an incident wave that's traveling to the right, it's going to have a reflected wave drawn with dotted lines traveling to the left. It does kind of look like DNA. So we call that an incident wave and a reflected wave. Okay. But then I have two waves on the same string. What happens when you have two waves in the same medium at the same time? What is that called? It begins with an I. Can you repeat the question? Interference. Two waves on the same string at the same time is interference. Um, and so what actually happens in a standing wave is you have an incident wave and a reflected wave that interfere with each other. What do we call these, these bumps right here? Close? Antinodes where the amplitude is biggest, right? What that actually is, is that's a point where you have constructive interference. And constructive means that the amplitudes add together to make a bigger wave. All right, so we call that constructive interference with the antinodes. And then what about, what is that point called? The node. And the node would be our destructive interference. So standing waves kind of put a bunch of different things together. It puts together reflection and interference to make a pattern of nodes and antinodes. Okay. If we want to keep going, the other thing that this has in it is this also has some elements of resonance. Standing waves only occur at certain frequencies, just like resonance frequencies only occur at certain frequencies. So this is also an example of resonance because resonance occurs at specific frequencies. I'm gonna put F for frequencies. So the reason we study standing waves is it kind of puts together all these different wave behaviors. But if you're like a musician, you actually use standing waves all the time. You know how when you play a ukulele or any string instrument, it doesn't sound like when I play something off the uh, function generator, right? That thing you're using Tuesday? Yeah, that like, yeah. Oh, I make great noise, <laughs> right? It doesn't sound like just one note, right? The reason an instrument sounds the way it does, and it makes a really pleasant noise, is that it actually doesn't play one frequency you're hearing a combination of lots and lots of frequencies together. And that complex frequency, that complex like combination of frequencies makes a musical note. So the math and stuff we're gonna work on today is how do we predict what notes we're gonna hear when we play a string instrument. Next week when we get in, we'll do tube instruments. One of the problems with things like percussion or vocal, instruments is those don't have really nice, easy to work with geometry. So in our class, we're going to do like, like the nice, easy to work with geometry. Um, and the first geometry thing 
How about we do the wavelength? Okay. All right. If I wanted to do the wavelength of a wave, a wavelength is one complete up and down, right? So when I look at my wave, one complete up and down is not the whole string. How about we put this right here? One wavelength is equal to the length of two antinodes. And there's going to be an equation for this. So you could look at the string and kind of like proportion this out if you want. Or you could use an equation for it. This equation is going to let you calculate the wavelength of any wave on a string. So you can use it to find the frequencies that you would hear. So step one, how to find the wavelength. The wavelength of any wave depends on the length of the string and how many harmonics there are. So put a little box around this equation. This one says the wavelength of my wave, I take the length of the string and you're gonna want that in meters. Divide it into however many harmonics there are, right? So you know how in this picture, there's three antinodes? This would be the N equals three harmonic, right? Three antinodes, third harmonic. So when we do this, you can think of this equation as splitting the length of the string up into three pieces and taking two thirds of the length of the string. So in the example we're gonna use, let's say I choose the ukulele. I'm looking at the length of this string, right? And it's approximately like 0.4 meters. So in my example, the length of the string is 0.4 meters. This is the third harmonic. So I could use that to find the wavelength. So in my example, I'd have two times 0.4 over three. And that would give me a wavelength of something I can't do in my head. If you can math this out in your head, that would be great. If not, I'm gonna use a calculator to get something like 2.6, or sorry, 0.26 meters. So we got step one, we found the wavelength. Step two, let's find the frequency. <laughs> yeah, they're doing wavelength and doing this. Wavelength. Step two, let's find the frequency that you would hear because of it. What I would need is I need the wave speed equation. That one you've seen before. V is the wave speed. And when I'm talking about the, the speed of the wave in this case, I mean the speed of the transverse wave traveling through the, traveling through the ukulele. Not the speed of sound, the speed of the transverse wave on this string. So I'm gonna put a speed of 500 as an example. Usually the speed of a wave on a string is pretty high. When you play an instrument, you normally put the tension up pretty high in order to play it. You can imagine if the tension were really low, it wouldn't really make a great sound. Nope. So I found my wavelength. I'm given the speed of my problem. Let's find the frequency. I would be taking 500 for the speed, a wavelength of 0.267 and frequency divide by wavelength to the other side. And that is a number I can't do in my head either. This is a frequency of 1,875 Hertz. So that's perfect. That's like right in the human hearing range. This is actually where like humans are relatively sensitive to these frequencies. If it's like in the low hundreds, that's harder to hear than if it's in this part. Let's do one more thing, right? Last equation for the day, and then I'm gonna have you go try some problems together. We know how to calculate the wavelength. It depends on how long the string is and what harmonic you're playing. We can turn that into a frequency if we know the speed of the wave on the string. 
But that's not the main frequency you hear. The main frequency you hear when you play an instrument is called the fundamental frequency. It's the frequency of the first harmonic. It's not the third harmonic, but it's actually really easy to go back and forth between the different harmonics. This equation. is our harmonic equation. And what it says is if you know the frequency of the third harmonic, that it's three times bigger than the first harmonic. Okay. In these cases, N is always the number of harmonics, some whole number, one, two, three, four, et cetera. So for instance, if you knew the third harmonic, you would know it's three times as big as the first harmonic. Since we know the third harmonic is 1,875 hertz, I can go back and find the first harmonic. The first harmonic is so important. It's called the fundamental frequency. It's the main note that you hear when you hear a string instrument. So if I divide that by three, the main frequency I hear is 625 hertz. So we can actually pick out, mathematically calculate all of the harmonics. Um, if you're a music person, each one of the harmonics is one octave up from each other. So if your fundamental frequency is 625 hertz, then one octave up would be 1250, right? It would be twice as big. Two octaves up would be three times as big, actually. Let's see if I have any, I don't have clear board space. A thing you'll often see is you'll often see little T-charts where let's say you take your harmonics, you'd have your first frequency is 625, your second frequency is twice as big, your third frequency is three times as big, and you could get it to get any frequency. <laughs> Find the fundamental frequency and multiply it by four to get the fourth harmonic. Okay. So I'm looking at these three new equations and those are the ones I want you to try out. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do this whiteboard thing. 